This is Plan B, Episode 11, for June 18th, 2013. And welcome to Plan B, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show contemplating the future and present of Bitcoin with insights for the novice, shop talk for the expert, and opinionated discussion for the interested observer of Bitcoin and related technologies. My name is Chris and joining me every single week is my co-host, Drew. Hello. Good afternoon to you, sir. And to you too. Happy episode 11. Guess what, Drew? Uh, I'll, ne- I'll never guess, man. Come on. Big show. What? Yeah, big show. I actually thought it was going to be the medium show because uh, I thought our guest was going to be in the air, but it turns out uh, I just heard from him, so he should be joining us later. And he's going to be talking about Bex.io or Bex.io. That'll be uh, something pretty interesting because one of our reoccurring topics on this show is the big Gox problem, the big Gox problem in the room. And so uh, we're going to chat with them and maybe some of the ways they're going to help us solve that problem. Plus, we've got a bunch of really good feedback and some altcoin discussion as well as some very provocative clips that hit the web from Bitcoin 2013 news and clips from the conference has still been slowly trickling out over the last few weeks from uh, Bitcoin uh, 2013 future of payments. And uh, I grabbed uh, some uh, excerpts from some of that stuff. So we'll be covering that too, Drew. It's going to be a good show today. Indeed. Bring it on. All right, let's start with the feedback. First one this week comes from Tom and Tom writes in, I'm not sure if this was covered, and uh, Or if I missed it, but I found it very interesting. I'm by no means an expert. This is just a thought on the idea of a 51% attack. That is a 51% attack on Bitcoin. Although it appears that some still fear it and some dismiss it as not possible, I think it still could be under the right conditions. All right. Well, let's see what he, well, let's see. We'll, we'll indulge him here. <laughs> Take the fact that ASICs will become the new standard. This will kill off large portions of miners and centralize them into fewer locations. Now, given enough time, it could be plausible that the majority of the mining is controlled by a few. If some were to hack those few and interrupt them for a few minutes, they could become the 51%. Some comparison to today's numbers. We see on the mining pools that Bitcoin, ASICs, and 50 BTC slush control are at the top of the pools. Okay. So he's saying we got these top pools here. Now some yeah, say, uh, now someone hacked uh, BTC or five hundred or fifty BTC or the slush pool to gain control for what they say is a resolved block. Not sure if this is fully possible with some of these viruses coming out. Who knows anymore? They now control over fifty one percent of the hashing power. They could then modify the blockchain how they see fit, not by controlling the hashing, but by but but a connection to the hashing. So in in other words, the people doing the hashing. I'm not sure if I have something wrong here, but a modified version of this could be possible, couldn't it, Tom? All right, so I think Tom's working on. I, 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 I so I think Tom is concerned about a couple of things, and he's basing it on some big assumptions. Number one, I, I think, uh, although we have a story about Avalon today, I think companies like Avalon and eventually Butterfly Labs are going to push out ASICs out into the majority of users. We also see, you know, different types of ASIC form factors that are still being developed. So if anything, I think ASICs are going to be um, responsible for distributing the hashing power, not so much for consolidating it. Yes, consolidating it first, but I don't know what yeah, do you think about the virus angle and all that, Drew. Well, I mean, uh, the thing about the ASIC stuff is like, you know, I, I think what he's talking about is, is like a small window of time where ASICs kind of take over and some GPU guys kind of drop off. So it kind of, it, I guess he's kind of talking about a possibility of the reducing of the uh, of the difficulty level, or right. actually, well, I guess, um, I guess while well, increasing it, because, you know, the ASICs aren't going to make up the GPUs, or are rather. But, um, um, I mean, because he's, I guess he's saying like, if you can take off, if you can take out a couple of the main uh, mining pools, then you're kind of free to do whatever you want if you have enough hashing power. Yeah. So if you get a, a guy, a couple a guys to consolidate. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you first have to, you have to assume you can get a virus that somehow takes over a machine that's critical to the pool's control, and then you have to then assume that the word wouldn't spread immediately via Twitter and the forums and Reddit. And that the miners wouldn't just shut down their hardware. And I guess maybe that's the results he would want, but I don't know. I just, that's a lot of supposition. Yeah. Or a maybe. It, it's a very, very, it seems like a very, very, very low probability that that would occur. 
I guess if but I guess really- he's saying, I mean, because I mean, once the, once once the polls get back online, I would think that um, the majority of the people in the network are going to be good, so they're going to eventually, you know, outpace the number of of generated blocks to you know pass them and kind of invalidate the uh, forked blockchain. I guess if somebody was super motivated, like really, you know, really, really and, motivated. And you'd have to attack, uh, you know, different backends too. Cause like we were talking about with this, with this, uh, this, uh, guest coming on later of having like a centralized, um, software as a service in the back, in the back end running a single system. But, um, I'm thinking, I, I would hope that most of these pools are kind of running their own, um, you know, generally their own mining software, you know, or the pool software for it. So I think you'd have to attack each one maybe in different ways if they're, if they're built differently. Yeah, that's. That's that's very true. You would have to come up with a different attack. It's almost it's almost easier just to go after uh, you know your coin bases or your or your companies like that than it is maybe one of these pools because these each pool is going to have their own setup, their own admins and passwords, their own types of hardware, or, you know all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so to do three at once, you'd have to you know have uh, quite a bit of knowledge. Yeah, there'd have to be some fundamental flaw you could take advantage of, and that would be big news. But you know it's always good to be thinking about this stuff because mm-hmm. that's how you protect from it. So stay vigilant, Tom. All right, uh, Payotor? How do you, uh, Drew, uh, what do you think? <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll leave that to you. Payotor writes in, he says, uh, how could you have missed this? And then he includes a link to an image, and it is of the uh, ASCII USB block eruptor. Apparently, they started doing group uh, buys back in May, and uh, they are 330 mega hashes per USB stick, and, you know, about a half a watt, and they run right off USB power at half a watt. If I knew about these, I would not have set up my, <laughs> my new 6990 rig. I got two GPUs in there, and I got to sell now because the PTC price is plummeting because of these little bastards, he says. I uh, <laughs> hope this helps you too. Now, didn't we actually talk about these? Uh, I, I don't think we did. No, I know I shut your it. face. Shut I, your I face. I thought we didn't. I specifically remember showing a picture of them on the, uh, on the, on the stream. Maybe I guess only, I shouldn't drink on the show then. Maybe, well, I, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not going to hold you a standard that I'm not going to follow. Uh, <laughs> I Maybe we only talked about them on the pre-show, I, but I'm almost positive we talked about these. Almost My positive. memory is blank with that. Okay, but, uh, all right. Well, it's very cool. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons we didn't talk about it maybe in the show is I'm hesitant to talk about group buy stuff on the show that I don't know through and through is good. I just don't want to recommend a group buy and then have people in the audience get ripped off. True, yeah. So it's hard. Now, if this was like somebody who has shipped and has had some successful group buys, I feel like if you want to get involved in a group buy, you know, you should probably check out the Bitcoin talk forums. That's where a lot of those uh, take place. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, KM Broadcasting says, uh, you did it when I was talking to you. Oh, okay. So we did talk about it on the show. So yeah, KM called in uh, oh, okay. weeks ago, remember? That sounds more familiar. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably we don't remember because it just happened during a, a, a viewer call. All right, next email comes from Mike. He says, hi, Chris and Drew. Love the new show, and I'm just getting started with Bitcoin and maybe a little Litecoin. Boy, it sure takes a long time to download the blockchain. Yeah, I just hit eight gigs <laughs> eight today. Eight gigs. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. <clears throat> a big problem everyone seems to have is how to buy Bitcoins with U.S. dollars. I thought of a way that I have not heard suggested. It would be great if someone could persuade Coinstar to offer Bitcoins as an option when turning in coins. Their machines are just about everywhere. Keep up the great work. It's a good idea, but they're going to be converting USD to Bitcoins. And I think that might classify them under our, our ruler's regulatory scheme as a money transmitter. Yeah. And I think they're going to have to find out information about you that you're going to have to register and report to them, like a lot of these exchanges have, where you have to report some personal information and all that to do that. So, I mean, I think our rulers uh, might uh, not let us do that. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it is a really cool idea. And you got to wonder if maybe like if we fast forward years into the future where a lot of this stuff has been worked out and Bitcoin is much more commonplace or cryptocurrencies in general are more commonplace. They seem like the the perfect kind of business that would want to get into that kind of thing. And it would almost be better for them in a way because they could buy. Well, it would depend on how they could play the market. But if they bought a bunch of Bitcoin early on and then they could sell them later, <laughs> you know, for <laughs> coins at, a, at, a, at a, and get a gain. Um if they were early enough adopters. I, I wish it was as easy. Uh, Drew and I have a sort of, this has been one of the platforms of the show, is it needs to be easier. Um, he and I just both recently uh, did a little Coinbase uh, testing. We bought Bitcoins via Coinbase for you guys, you know, right, Drew? That's why you did it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, for the audience. Yeah. I never bought it through Coinbase before. I, I was actually completely ignorant to how easy it was to do. So you, it, it is really easy, because I was thinking I was going to have to go through exchange, transfer money through no, Walla. no. 
I know. I, I, I can't believe that here I am, you know, on this podcast and I had no idea how freaking easy it was. I haven't gotten the coins yet, but uh, they're supposed to be arriving tomorrow. So you have, uh, you had to attach it to your bank account, right? Yep. And you can, and then you can do that with two ways. So you can, you can have them authenticate to your bank for you, which I didn't do, or they can, you know, like, uh, like I think PayPal does it to confirm your account or whatever, where they deposit very small, um, uh, 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 dollar amounts. So like a couple of cents here and there, um, into your bank account. And then I actually appeared on mine the very next day. So you got verified pretty quick. Yeah. You get verified. And then you had to wait a few days, right? You had to wait about a week before you actually got the bitcoins. Yeah. I, I, I purchased them, I think last Thursday and I haven't got them yet. I'm supposed to get them. Tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, when I bought them, they, you know, they took about four or five days to receive them. And, and that's not a big deal. Cause I mean, cause we're in for a long, so it's not like, you know, we need to buy now to spend now, you know? Right. You see, that was, well, that's how I figure too. I'm not buying the bitcoins to spend them immediately. I'm buying to hold them for a little while. Um, and so I figured, you know, as I always kind of start to do when the price gets down around a hundred dollars, I start to get a little tempted, <laughs> right? I start, start to rubbing think, your chin. Yeah. I start thinking, oh, and then of course I always remind myself that I'm not supposed to try to catch a falling knife, but I can't help myself. I know. So I bought around. Well, you're staring at the ticker all day, man. Yeah, I am. I bought around 107. So right now we're hovering around 105. So I haven't really eaten too much of a loss. Yeah, you know, we're doing all right. Bought, I only bought a couple, but, uh, Coinbase is the way I went too. I, I like, first of all, one of the reasons I like to use Coinbase is uh, I I believe it's really, really important for Bitcoin to, to, to get the barrier of entry way, way down for buying them. They need to be as easy as buying points for an online game service. You need to be like, you know, super straightforward. They need to be like buying internet fun box points. Right. So I love the idea of Coinbase and I kind of want to support them and also use them. So that way I can talk about it a little bit here on this show because I've done it now a couple of times on there and we're also using them for the donations to the show. People want to tip us um, and thank us for doing a Bitcoin podcast. We accept Bitcoin donations via Coinbase. And so I'm using them from that angle too. And all of it is really not because it's necessarily the best way to do it or whatever, you know, whatever you, a label you want to give it, just because I feel like it's really important to sort of road test this stuff. Right. I mean, and it's still, I mean, a lot of stuff is kind of niche. So there's, it's a very small pool of people that are getting into this. The, 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 the greater degree, the greater the degree that we lower the barrier of entry for people to get into it, the more the quickly, more quickly it's going to widespread. Yeah, everywhere. exactly. Exactly. And also I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've bought from Coinbase a couple of times and I haven't had a problem and they've also gotten some funding recently. So I'm, you know, that kind of uh, makes me feel a little better too. True. Yeah. They got a lot of money, didn't they? Man, that, I think it was like 5 million. That's not bad, right? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. So uh, anyways, Mike, uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for the email. Let us know if you decide to get into Litecoin. All right. Nicholas writes in, he says, uh, first, I would like to thank you for all the high quality content at Jupiter Brock. Oh, well, thank you, Nicholas. I'm a supporter of Unfiltered and enjoy watching Plan B and your other shows on occasion as well. Recently, when going through articles online, I ran into Namecoin. Namecoin, as far as I can tell, is a fork of Bitcoin with a few interesting differences. Once you have a certain number of Namecoins, you can purchase an entry of a short message that everyone running the software will be able to read at any time. Programs now use, exist to use this entry for both DNS and SSL. Of course, there could be many more applications for an entry, but I think that even these two things can be incredibly important. Providing DNS and SSL certs is a large business. Having to pay $3, thanks to uh, various GoDaddy codes, by the way, for domains and sevens for certs, in my opinion, does not properly reflect the actual effort that is required to get these systems to work. Also, with various authoritarian, authoritarian governments starting to take a hostile view on the Internet, the way that certificate authorities are set up might no longer be sufficient. If a government can pressure CAs to sign fake SSL certs and then do a man-in-the-middle attack, it becomes possible for the citizens uh, uh, that a uh, man-in-the-middle attack uh, becomes possible on the citizens of a country. This is not a desirable situation. By having SSL certs being cryptographically verified by name coins, we can circumvent this situation. A link to an article in the Turkey about Turkey potentially doing this to spy on government workers. We've actually covered that in uh, TechSnap a bit too. Um, we have reason to believe it happened to Iran, and who knows where else that could happen, where essentially the government can uh, eavesdrop on communications because they go to the certificate issuer and and get the back door. Imagine basically. That. Yeah, and uh, Namecoin's interesting. It's it's very similar to Bitcoin, in that, except for that differentiator that it supports that like memo aspect to it. Yeah, it's cool how the it's cool how this Bitcoin technology is kind of being forked and and kind of creating you know its own darknet, I guess, right? So you're kind of going offline because yeah. you're gonna have to you know uh, point your DNS to or applications on your system uh, through DNS to this thing. You kind of have like a sub internet, right? Because you have well, you have Bitcoin is sort of uh, below the the system for payments. Then you have Namecoin, which is below the system for 
name resolution, which prevents uh, uh, government seizures, and then you could uh, layer that on top of things like uh, Tor. You got yourself a bit of a dark net there. Yeah, it's interesting to think, I mean, like how, you know, how this stuff is going to evolve. Like, are, what, what principles of Bitcoin are we going to see uh, evolve into different forms of software to solve different problems? Because this is a really, I, I hadn't looked into it at all, but it looks like a very interesting thing. It looks like, you know, at least some other instances can be expanded to do uh, even cooler things. Yeah, I think Namecoin is one of these things where it has a lot of potentials because you've got this field that you can insert data into. Uh, so uh, right now that's being used for DNS and SSL, but I guess theoretically it could be used for all kinds of things. Um, and, and some estimations peg it to be like the number three cryptocurrency after Litecoin, you know, which is preceded by Bitcoin. I don't know if you that's better true. better stay at number two. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how true that is. Uh, but I, it, it, so sometimes what people say to us is, uh, man, Bitcoin would be awesome if all of that mining CPU or mining power, you know, electricity power wasn't used just to make coins, but if it was also used to set do SETI at home or folding at home like if you could also use it to to do good and right. in a way not that what bitcoin is doing isn't absolutely good i mean i don't think people who say that don't appreciate how restructuring our you know monetary systems would be would be dramatic a, a dramatic overhaul so i think people that say that sometimes are downplaying the value of bitcoin but you could also then make the argument that well not only is it securing the transaction network and providing this amazing currency but it's also fundamentally providing the name resolution for the internet at some point. And that is extremely, uh, extremely compelling. And, and then, you know, I could have Jupiter Broadcasting dot bit that is resolved via Namecoin. Pretty neat. Yes, I mean, yeah, it's pretty sweet. It is pretty sweet. We have, we'll have a great article, coindesk.com, just posted it today, actually, uh, explaining what Namecoin is. I guess maybe there's getting to be more interest in Namecoin, maybe with all of the uh, NSA stuff going on and all that kind of stuff. People are just kind of trying to think of how to decentralize everything we need online. Everything we depend online could be decentralized. And uh, yeah, and it's going to be a nice little blueprint for, uh, blueprint for it. Like people were talking about, you know, if it's designing some voting system based around Bitcoin, maybe somebody will be, will be able to figure that out, you know, kind of with some principles taken from Bitcoin and Namecoin. Well, and one of the things we don't talk a lot about is Bitcoin itself has a capacity uh, for, um, you know, uh, essentially... Um, uh, the capacity for contracts, you know, to, to establish contracts between people. I mean, there's a lot of other things the Bitcoin protocol can do that we're not even using right now. We're kind of all just distracted by the price issues and, <laughs> and the blockchain size. But there's a lot of other things it can do. Uh, I, I think it's really exciting to watch where some of this stuff goes. So Namecoin seems like one to watch. And if anybody out there has a lot of experience with it or any thoughts on Namecoin or is maybe doing some multi-coin mining, I know a lot of people out there that are now getting into mining or just like mining multiple coins. Let us know. Leave us a voicemail. Call into the show one three fifty two. 587-5262. Let's get some uh, name coin coverage on the show, and you can help us do it by calling one three fifty two fifty eight plan b and leave us a voicemail. And if you do, we might just cover that next week. All right, Drew. So speaking of KM, he wrote in with a question that I thought we'd cover before we got to our guest, and then we'll give our guest a call. And uh, he wanted to ask, he says, hi, guys. Since you guys have invested into Litecoin, especially Drew. Hey, uh, I was wondering what you guys did with the coins. Do you put them into a Litecoin QT wallet? Do you use a service like BTCE to swap them for Bitcoin? Also, I would love to have a look at Trezor. What is Trezor? If you guys have a spare Bitcoins laying around, what is that? What is that? Anyway, Trezor? Yeah. Oh. As uh, always. Like, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, oh, no, Trezor is like, uh, like a hardware thing that okay, will so, sign, yeah. sign your transaction. That's what I thought. Uh, as always, keep up the great show. Uh, you guys uh, look forward to the next episode, Cam. Also, uh, he says, uh, maybe expect a few coins to come our way. hey oh. He also suggests we should accept Litecoin. <laughs> yeah, Chris. <laughs> so I have, uh, I have a little Litecoin story that we're going to try to get to at the end of the show if we have time. But where are you at right now with Litecoins? Because last time we talked, you and I were shutting down our mining rigs. Yeah, I completely shut down. I pulled the card out of my thing. It's on eBay right now. A couple of days, it'll be gone. So wow, I ain't mining anything anymore. Um, I don't know if I ever will in the future, but uh, the card's going away. But the, um, I haven't done anything with my Litecoin. The only thing I did really was use BTC to convert it to, to some Bitcoin so I could uh, throw some dice. You know what I'm saying? But uh, beyond that, I haven't put it in a wallet. I haven't uh, you know dropped in the Litecoin wallet. I haven't used any cloud service. It literally just sits in the exchange. And hopefully it's still there. I haven't checked in a while. But <laughs> hopefully my 900, it hasn't left. Last time we talked about Litecoin, I said I was shutting down the mining rigs. And I did. They're all, they've all been off. And I got to tell you, it's been kind of nice not having the heat problem, not worrying about what they're doing, not going out in the studio and you know having it to be 
you know, super hot out there and like walking into a hot box. All that's been really nice. However, however, I have a story at the end of the show I want to get to that's kind of changing my mind. Again, I think Litecoin right now has an opportunity to become the internet fun box currency where people are willing to sort of just use it like karma points, right? Like, uh, you know, people buy people buy karma gold or whatever on Reddit. Mm-hmm. It, that's nothing. It is that is nothing. Yeah. That it is literally nothing. Although it does help with the comments, you know, comment threads. That's nice. So, uh, and I have it, right? I've got like a, I've got it for like a while. I, I I don't remember if it was given to me or and I give it out all the time. I'm giving people if people make good comments in any of the Jupiter Broadcasting subreddits, like something that's really great, and I catch it, I'll toss them some gold for the comment. Mm-hmm. So you know. Litecoin could become the internet fun box money because it's not quite as valuable, so people are more generous with it. Uh, it'd, it'd be great for gambling. It'd be great for you know internet wide karma tipping type stuff. So I I am very hopeful that Litecoin might see a little more interest. We'll see. We'll see. I just read an article this week that talked about how a lot of people who are moving away from Bitcoin mining aren't like we've been sort of theorizing. They're not necessarily moving to Litecoin like we kind of thought maybe they would. What they're doing is they're sort of doing uh, uh, like opportunistic mining where they're kind of just going wherever the profit is for that week. And I don't really know the details and what other cryptocurrencies they would be working on. Uh, but it, according to this, according to this, uh, I can't remember if it was a forum post or what that I read, they, they estimated about 10,000 active Litecoin miners at any given time. And, and not total Litecoin miners, because what they're saying is you have, it's sort of a revolving door of miners where people are moving around and switching out what they're mining to all the time, kind of waiting for the next cryptocurrency to sort of really take hold. And then they'll kind of switch over whole hog to that. Um, So I look at this and I go, there's sort of a moment right now in Litecoin's history where it's in the sweet spot for GPU mining and the difficulty is low enough where I can actually see a decent return. Could be that never goes anywhere. It also could be that this is 2011 for Litecoin and that in another two years... I'm going to be SOL on GPU mining and I'll wish I would have gotten them when I could. Yeah. I mean, cause we kind of seen saw the same thing. Like I would have kept mining bitcoins back in the day if I, you know, if I knew it was going to get over five bucks, so I wouldn't have stopped as quickly as I had, but uh, yeah, hopefully it does. Yeah. You know, exactly. I think maybe that's part of it is I, I kind of got burned by stopping mining back in 2011. Yeah, I wish I had continued. Right? Right? So now oh, I'm like, yeah. am I making the same mistake all over again? Am I repeating my my mistake? Because that would be, I'd really be kicking myself <laughs> in two years, right? <laughs> With both of your feet now, right. not just one. Right, yeah, yeah. I got big Bitcoin on one foot and Litecoin on the other foot, and I'm <laughs> kicking myself in the butt. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, it does pick up. So I think what I'm going to do is maybe not go whole hog and have all of my rigs, but I'm just going to have a rig off to the side doing its thing. You know, maybe pulling away 400 mega hashes at it from time to time. I don't know. Yeah, something here and there. Yeah, I, I, I want. I, can't, I can't take the heat. That's 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 the only reason, yeah. reason I'm jumping out. Yeah, of I'm it. not even I'm not even fully into that yet. You know, I I have uh, I've been lucky that uh, uh, it's it's actually stayed a little cooler in here in the Washington state uh, the last few weeks. So I'm not dealing with the 90 degree temperatures that uh, Drew might have to be yeah. dealing with. All right, well, I think I got Jesse on the line here, and uh, Jesse is from Box.io, and uh, he's going to join us today to talk a little bit about it. Jesse, are you there? Yeah, just give me one second to switch rooms here. Yeah, sure, no problem, Jesse. So uh, while he's switching rooms, I'll tell you guys a little bit about Bex.io. So Bex.io proposes to allow you to build your own Bitcoin exchange. So talk about solving the Gox problem that we've mentioned a lot on the show. Uh, and it sounds like what – and I'm we'll, uh, of course uh, – talk to Jesse about this, but it sounds like Bex.io is offering sort of the infrastructure backends that a exchange would need. The scalability, the processing performance. Scalability, the processing um, performance. Uh, well, hello there. Hi there. That's me. I hear me. Um, so the, uh, they, they have what we're proposes to be sort of a way for folks to roll their own Bitcoin exchange in a sense without having to do the backend is my understanding. Jesse, did I get all that just about right? That's almost exactly right. Yeah, we're supplying the entire tech stack in the back and partnering with people up front that have all the uh, banking, regulatory, and marketing channels to, to execute on the exchange. So I could be uh, I could be uh, maybe a front end guy that designs a, a UI around your back end. We are uh, we're actually shipping with our own interface. That's sort of uh, kind of industry standard. Like I heard you guys talking about how great Coinbase has done and building their interface and how easy it is to use. 
We use a lot of sort of industry best practices that are already in place with the exchanges and just go from there. So we, we will offer people the opportunity to build their own on top of our APIs, but we are going to ship a default interface as well. Okay. So, and, and the way you guys will kind of earn a living is by, uh, is it based on a percentage of the exchange's uh, um, profits? Yeah, it's a it's, uh, percentage of trans- transaction fees. So we're just splitting them with our phone. Okay, I see. I, so if I'm, if I'm not wildly successful, here, here was a little pitch we had on the pre-show. And, and Jesse, tell me if this is where you guys could see a, fitting a role. Do you see yourself as sort of trying to go at a, go- like having multiple Gox size exchanges? Or do you see yourself sort of um, more like uh, community size exchanges where you'd have maybe a, a Bitcoin talk form uh, exchange, a Bitcoin subreddit form, maybe we'd have a plan B show exchange, maybe only 200, 300 people would be on it, maybe a thousand people. What, what kind of scale do you see this for? So the, the honest answer there is, is we don't really know. I mean, everyone's looking at Al Gox and rec- recognizing that um, that's kind of holding back the Bitcoin world and it will at some point over the next year or so kind of erode and the market share is going to disperse. So it's, it's quite clear to us that, that that's going to decentralize. Um, it's not clear how far it's going to decentralize. Is it going to be a thousand exchanges in a thousand different cities or is it going to go down to, you know, sort of four or five big exchanges and then potentially reconsolidate? So um, we're not sure what the answer is. So we're just putting ourselves in the market and letting the market kind of determine what, what the result will be. Now, it seems like to me that potentially one of the uh, biggest features you guys could essentially offer would be all of the regulatory end of stuff. How how much is that going to be your burden versus somebody who participates in this system? So um, we're as much as possible trying to offload that burden um, just because we are already in a couple different countries here and it would be impossible for us to keep up with the regulatory issues in every single country. So... We're going to work with partners as, as we onboard them to help them understand the, their, the concerns in their local environments. Ideally, and we've been lucky with this so far, our partners have great um, understanding of the, of the local regulatory environment. And so we're not having to, to dig up a lot of those answers ourselves. But that's to be determined sort of. It's, it seems like to me that uh, you'd sort of be a victim of your own success in, in two ways. Uh, one, since you'd sort of be the glue that's holding all of these exchanges together, you might become a regulatory you might get a target on your back from the regulator from the regulators, but then secondarily, it seems like attackers, you know, the the DDoS kitties out there and things like that. If they take you down, don't they then essentially have the ability to take down all of the front end exchanges? Yeah, um, every exchange is going to be remotely deployed, so they would have to coordinate attacks across ah. every single exchange. Um, so with a, a central code base, so it's it's possible there could be a similar or a consistent, you know, um, flaw in the exchange that, that would allow them to do that, but it would have to be a pretty coordinated attack. But they couldn't, like, take down your SQL database or your Oracle databases, and then all of a sudden all of the exchanges are down? No, they're all remotely deployed. So okay. that's, that, that just couldn't happen. Um, that's cool. From a regulatory standpoint, uh, certainly, yeah, um, we're, we're trying to structure it in a way that we're just a technology service provider, and it's it's... The person who runs the exchange is the actual contact point and making the transactions themselves, right? So from that, we're decentralizing that as much as possible as well, too. But so sounds like it sounds like somebody like like Jupiter Broadcasting or the Bitcoin subreddit or whoever uh, would could potentially work with you guys to set up their own small scale exchange, and then it would just be the cost of whatever the percentage is there. Have you guys worked all that out yet? Or are you still in the process of figuring that out? Yeah, um, so the way we've handled it so far is it's just on a case-by-case basis. So, for example, we're up in Canada. Um, the biggest exchange in Canada is, is called CA Vertex, and they um, they charge transaction fees starting at, I think, 2.9% down to around 1%. So, obviously, the local market here is tolerant of a higher transaction fee than it would be, for example, in the U.S., mm. um, which is much more familiar with the, the, the MT Gox percentages, right? So. So far, we've worked it out on a case-by-case basis. Um, absolutely, would partner with someone like this, the Reddit sub forum or, or you guys to sort of, um, we, we sort of view this as the more localized exchanges with local marketing channels, the better it is to grow the overall growth of Bitcoin. Right. That's what we were kind of theorizing on the pre-show is that uh, if you have... Uh, if you have hundreds or thousands of smaller exchanges, then A, the volume at any individual exchange is lower, so they become less of a target, and B, the processing and selling of Bitcoins is 
much more distributed than it is now. Um, and it sounds like that's backed up by the architecture design that you guys have, which is one of, which is what one of my concerns was. So it, I love what I kind of love the idea here is if uh, if you know a you guys are sort of handling a lot of the back end concerns and the infrastructure concerns and some of the regulatory stuff, but b it's it's sort of it's solving the gox problem by not another huge exchange, but by lots of little exchanges, right? Yeah, that's the idea. That's that's brilliant. Well, uh, Jesse, uh, we're definitely going to be keeping uh, tabs on this. So where should people go if they want to find out more information? Yeah, the website is uh, bex.io. Uh, so it's bex.io. Uh, we have a blog on there as well, too. We're sort of keeping people uh, regularly posted on, on our progress. We're going to have a product uh, mid-summer and our first exchange deployed down in New Zealand. So we're really excited about that. And then from there, we're just going to continue rolling them out as people keep signing up. Well, right on. You've got my email, so keep us posted as you guys go, and we'll we'll uh, we'll let people know what's going on. Okay. That sounds great. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Have a good one. There you go, Drew. We're gonna. Uh, I think we're gonna finally see the Gox problem solved through maybe a couple of different approaches. Oh yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I I'm. Uh, I don't know. Would we want to have a Jupiter Broadcasting Exchange? Maybe. I think you know. I think I like the idea because there's a little more trust there. Uh. It seems to me that I, uh, people might uh, people might be a little more if you know that it's built on a on a platform. So if so, assuming that Bex.io was a trusted platform and they gained a good reputation. So if you found out, oh, that's a Bex.io powered exchange. Okay, yeah, I know they've made some good code. They've done some good stuff. So then you have some trust there. Oh, that's Jupiter Broadcasting. Well, I listen to Plan B all the time, and I know that I'd just be trading with other Plan B listeners. So it's sort of like a known smaller community instead of these. Right. You know, it's still faceless people, but it's less faceless, right? Right, right. So yep. I, I think that's really great. Plus, you can smaller communities can be a lot more hands-on with the buying process, right? So we can offer a lot more support. We can answer questions in the IRC. Whereas when you go to like these huge monster exchanges, you're just another number. And if you get confused or lost or make mistakes, you know, you're you're kind of just SOL to go do. You got to go do a Google search and hope you find the right answer. Yeah, definitely. So that's also this. It could also help with the noob process too, by making, uh, by 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 making that transition of buying Bitcoin for that first time buyer easier with a little bit of community lube. That's all I'm saying, Drew. Just a little community lube. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thanks to Jesse for coming on, and uh, you guys go check out Bex.io. We'll have a link to that in the show notes if you're uh, interested, and uh, we'll keep you uh, posted on what's going on. All right. Well, why don't we move into the discussion? Uh, before we do that, I just want to remind folks that uh, we really appreciate it if you jump into iTunes, even if you're not a strong iTunes lover, which I realize is you know many of you. <laughs> it helps with discovery of the show. So if you could go into iTunes and uh, rate and comment on our show, then that's the little uh, the iTunes AI or whatever the uh, the Python script that manages iTunes or or the people. I don't. I'm not sure yet. I I actually think it might be people, but uh, <laughs> turns out made with people. Um, they, that system monitors the clicks of the, uh, of the, you know, of the stars and the comments and all of that stuff. And then based on that brings it up to the top. It doesn't even take a lot, four or five or six. If you go in there and do that, we can go, uh, up in the rankings. If, you know, a dozen of you or more go in there and leave comments and rate, uh, we could actually end up on the front page of iTunes, which then helps a bunch of people find the show and learn more about Bitcoin. So we really appreciate it if you guys uh, wouldn't mind doing that. It's it's a nice way to help with discovery of the show. And iTunes is still a huge way for people to find uh, podcasting content. And once they find it in iTunes, you know they'll they'll go out from there. But uh, I know I know it's I know it's hard. The chat room's already giving me a hard time. But here, you know, just to make it easier. I'm going to give them a link right there so they can just they can just click it. <laughs> link you to do the what show you got to do. Too. All right, let's talk about our one of our discussion topics this week. Eric uh, Vuhis, and I'm not sure if I'm getting that right. Vuhis or Vorhees. Uh, Eric is a well-known member of the Bitcoin community. He's in the Bitcoin Talk forum. He's a CEO of Coinapult, uh, based out of uh, uh, Pan-, uh, uh, Pan Am. I'm not sure where that is. Uh, furthermore, Eric's also a partner in a couple of super secret Bitcoin projects. Uh, he's a big uh, promoter of uh, the free state and hum- you know human rights and liberties. He's an, he's almost I think a lot of people consider him to be an activist. He's very well spoken and he's uh, very intelligent. I have a lot of respect for Eric, and he was at the Bitcoin 2013 Future of Payments conference, and his talk was just recently posted online, and we haven't got a chance to cover it, and he answered one of the things that people ask a lot, and that is, what is the fundamental question of Bitcoin? It's something we've tried to answer a lot, but it's still something, as people find our show, they email in or they text us and they say, hey guys, 
I'm liking what you're saying about Bitcoin, but really, I'm still not grasping what the actual value of is. And we've always tried to answer it. I think Eric does a great job. It's it's a couple of minutes long, his answer, but I've essentially taken uh, one of the best talks at the Bitcoin conference and boiled it down to a few minutes. So I think it's it's well worth it. And then I will link the full talk in the show notes where he answers in some questions and, and, and things like that. But uh, this is Eric on the value of Bitcoin. Economists and journalists often get... And it is, it's a little overblown. Sorry about that. But it's totally worth it. Caught up in this question, why does Bitcoin have value? And the answer is very easy because it is useful and scarce. I think these people should be asking the more important question, why do they have value? <laughs> and the corollary here is that Bitcoin's value can never reach zero unless it is no longer useful or no longer scarce. So this brings us to the more interesting topic. For if Bitcoin is so well engineered as money, won't it necessarily be begin competing with other forms of money? A fair question would be, well, if that were true, Eric, why have people not tended toward gold over the dollar? Isn't gold, as you claim, a, a superior form of money? The reason is that while gold works very well as a store of value, indeed the best that the world has ever known, it doesn't work so well as a means of exchange in our modern society, and this should be obvious. Transacting in physical gold is unfortunately quite a burden. And while services like e-gold had huge potential, they inevitably fail because as soon as they become successful, the government shuts them down. To those of you who don't know, e-gold was a company several years ago that allowed you to have a digital currency that was backed by gold, held by the e-gold company. And this was brilliant and it worked very nicely until they got too big and they were shut down. If a digital gold company becomes too successful, the government will simply destroy it. And this is why gold remains safely in vaults. It is used for storing wealth, but not used so well as a currency. So we see that physical bullion is too inconvenient. And a digital bullion currency is a fantasy because it requires backing by a party that can be shut down. This is also why anyone who suggests that Bitcoin should be backed by a real asset, such as gold, is gravely misunderstanding the situation. Backing injects counterparty risk because a specific person or entity must be obligated to fulfill the backing. A ba backing requires a backer. Bitcoin does not need backing because it is a digital commodity that is valuable itself and valuable in large part because it carries no physical burdens or constraints. It is this lack of physical backing which enables it to move anywhere instantly at near zero cost. So one can see that Bitcoin is revolutionary in this regard. For the first time ever, a form of money, superior to all others due to its specific attributes, has been successfully decentralized and decoupled from the material world in such a way that nobody can turn the system off. And the world has never seen this before. I think that there is now a certain inevitability that markets around the world will gradually gravitate toward the superior money. After all, money is a good like all others, and it competes for the attention of those using it. So I think it is fair to say that Bitcoin is a monumental invention that has finally been captured by mankind. And if you understand the deep and central role that money plays in every aspect of our lives, then might, it, might not Bitcoin be considered as important as things like the printing press or the automobile or the internet? And considering these other inventions, not everybody is literate, not everybody has a car, and not everybody is online, but everybody uses money. And for those who are wondering, you do not even need the internet to use Bitcoin. So all of you who are involved in this right now are making history. And perhaps most exciting about this is that the only thing which can derail this invention is an even better invention. If you play through the various scenarios in your mind, you'll realize that Bitcoin can only fail if a superior currency takes its place. In which case, mankind is even better off and the promise of Bitcoin will carry forward into its successor. Amen to that. And that is really why uh, I sort of have fundamental confidence in Bitcoin. Uh, if, if Mt. Gox were to uh, shut down tomorrow, Bitcoin would plummet very, very low, but it would not go to zero and it would come back. It would take longer than we all like, but it would come back. And and if Bitcoin ends up ends up not being the successful cryptocurrency, something else will. This this genie is out of the bottle. Yeah, and there's whatever is going to replace it, if something replaces it at some point in time, will likely have a lot of the similar principles. So it might be a different kind of system overall, but it's going to have very similar principles, so very similar attributes. So you're not really losing. Like he said, mankind will still be better off. Right, and there's a good chance I'll be able to buy it. 
with Bitcoin, at least initially. Oh, that's and true. you know, we uh, we live in a bubble, a first world bubble, Drew. But when you look at uh, developing nations like uh, Kenya, you can see how Bitcoin could be fundamental because Kenya's technology uh, development has been an interesting one. They've sort of skipped right to the mobile generation. They just they went past right over wired. You know, they didn't run wires all everywhere. They just went straight to mobile, and it makes sense. It's easier to deploy. And mobile technologies are cheaper to manufacture and ship around the world. And there's lots of mobile devices out there. And Kenya's in this in this interesting spot where where Bitcoin solves a lot of problems for them. Now, who's to say? Who's to say what's really going to happen? But I mean, I mean, picture Drew. You could see how an environment in Kenya where they're highly mobile, their technology is exploding. They've got uh, they've got they they are one of the fastest growing mobile phone markets in the world with twenty percent annual growth. 93% of Kenyan households own mobile phones, okay? Mm-hmm. So, and those, it, it, it's some it's some form, those all have a data connection. Uh, in Kenya, mobile payment systems are absolutely huge, right? Uh, you could see this, right? You can see how maybe Bitcoin could explode in an area like Kenya while it's just still being sort of played with here in the States. Right, because they don't really have that kind of payment infrastructure that like we do that kind of offsets the demand for Bitcoin because they would have a significant demand for it given what you just described. Or, and I'm not totally clear on this, but also I would think, you know, they're, they don't have the institutional incumbents that we do in the financial sector. True. Yeah. Like yep. we have, we have an, we have uh, incumbents that are intertwined with our federal government and uh, our very, our basic, our, our very basic structure here in the United States and they do not have that. I, I don't. I don't. I can't speak to any great authority on that. But my understanding is, is this is part of the problem, and part of the issue that Bitcoin solves is the currency problems that they have faced. There's a great chart on the GenesisBlock.com where they show uh, Kenya in- inflation rates uh, since '06, and it's just been, you know, their currency has been all over the board. And not that Bitcoin hasn't been, but uh, you could see in even just the early impl- early adoptions uh, usage in Kenya, it's already been extremely successful. And there's been um, uh, minor minor market adoption down there, and it's 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 taken off like crazy. And if, if something like this happens, I think people will start pretty clearly. It'll start pretty clearly answering that value question for the rest of us, right? Mm-hmm. I think Kenya Kenya looks at something like this potentially and. There's not even much of a value question there. All of the basic components that it, it, it solves are, are pretty are pretty obvious to them. So, kind of interesting to watch where that goes. Thanks to Todd for sending that into the show. Um, and we have a little more information about that in the show notes. There was a paper that came out that got the internet all upset this week. <laughs> actually, I'm not sure when the paper actually hit, but the discussions hit this week. I sent it to you uh, over the weekend. I was like, holy crap, Drew, look at this. <laughs> we found so all shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We did it! <laughs> Satoshi has been found. So it all started around this discussion about an NSA. Yes, that no. NSA paper from 1996. How to make a mint. Cryptography of anonymous electronic cash. And one of the experts referenced in this paper is a... How do you think you say it, Drew? Uh, um, like a Tatsuaki uh, Okamoto. Tatsuaki Otomoto, which sounds a lot like Satoshi. Uh-huh. And uh, people did some digging, as the internet is known to do. And it looks like this uh, this Mr. Um, Tatsuaki Okamoto is uh, proficient in C++, and he's written many a papers on cryptography, including... Um, he was the uh, one of the major editors on a decentralized peer-to-peer cryptography paper that was published a couple of years ago. He's still publishing papers today. Um, he's also done some uh, some papers on cryptography-based contracts. Uh, it's 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 very interesting. There's a lot of similarities here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, maybe Satoshi is a. Uh, is this is this uh, is this Okamoto, and he's been writing these papers and a C plus plus developer, and he finally decided to put all of his theory into practice. Yeah, true. That that's it, it, there's there's a couple of similarities like within that paper. I mean, um, so they're talking about they they're talking about using public key crypto, you know, within the NSA paper uh, for what they're talking about over there. They they speak about um, I, I reread both I reread the Bitcoin white paper and and most of of this NSA document. So they both talk about double spending. They talk about signing um, transactions. They talk about um, hashing all the algor- algorithms and public key crypto. And it, it's a, there's a different philosophy. They, they mentioned like five different protocols for how an like an online 
um, electronic currency could work. And there's, I don't see uh, significant similarities to Bitcoin with that, but yeah, at least in, it's fact, the in fact, in that paper, like they talked about using banks, it was not a decentralized system right, at right. all. There was like a central authority that was issuing certificates, like to, you know, deem your identity. So you weren't even, right. you know, they, they weren't, you know, describing something like with Bitcoin, where you do not have to be connected to the internet to create your own address, your own identity, your own. That key. was the 96 paper. However, right. in a 2007 paper where he was the committee chairman for the paper, oh. They released a. Uh, they released this paper called "Running on Karma: Peer-to-Peer -peer Reputation and Currency Systems." Right? I mean, mm -hmm. come on, come on. That it's all pretty, about. Uh, it, it's all about using cryptology to do verified, trustable transactions without having to know the identity of the person using a peer-to-peer -peer system. I don't know. You know, is it Satoshi? I honestly, I hope not. And the reason I hope nobody why, finds him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hope nobody finds him because just like what's happening now with Edward Snowden, it becomes about the man. In. Yeah, they're going to dig into his history. Oh, right. look at this. Oh, right. look what he said before about these guys. He must be a bad guy. Right. And I'm sure they'll find anti-government statements and things like <laughs> that. We've seen indications to that. So I, I almost hope it's not him. And here's the thing, Drew. This paper was published in 1996. Isn't it just possible that Satoshi just read it? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know why the internet's getting all freaked out about this. Maybe he just read it and agreed with it. Because this guy, uh, this uh, Okamoto guy, I guess is really well respected in the muckety muck cryptography industry. Like, he's he's been publishing papers forever. He's got uh, he's got tons of cred. And it seems like if you were really into this or a student of cryptography, you'd probably end up coming across this guy's work. That's how well known he is. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> Blew my mind, man. It makes sense. <laughs> I don't know why I never thought of that. Jeez. Well, you know, people really want to know. You know, I people know, right? really want to know. It is a really interesting thing. It's like, you know, where's Waldo, but you don't know what he looks like or his name. And, you know, okay. What if it is an NSA created experiment? Because that's what that was the other component of this is this was a paper that was written on behalf of an, it was written by this group of people for from like universities and things like that, but it was written for the NSA. And the NSA was trying to show that Hey, we think at least this is what I this is what I gleaned from it. Hey, we think money might go in this direction someday, and if oh. if it's going to go in this direction, the United States government better seed it that way. When it hits, we we we're hit. We've we're holding a controlling position, and so a lot of people thought maybe Satoshi was this uh, maybe some sort of hacker group at the NSA who created this. They mined a lot of the early coins that way the the federal government could sit on them, let the people start using the system, field test it at, at scale. And then if it's successful, oh, boom, we were Satoshi all along. And by the way, we've got a million coins. I don't know. What, 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 why would they do that, though? Like, what would be the incentive? Like, yeah, they what, would. what kind of benefit would they, would they obtain? I don't think they would, but it does show you, I mean, they published this first paper in 96. They're yeah. certainly interested in the subject, yeah. They're thinking way ahead. I mean, that's pretty clever. Uh, so... What if it was created by the NSA? What if it is a government created or some sort of state backed creation? <laughs> then it might be an NSA Q against the uh, monetary system. <laughs> Seems like. I mean, I wonder if it matters because if you think about it, the internet was created by a state, right? Um, I mean, a lot of what we rely on today, I mean, the current monetary system. The blueprint, yeah. The current monetary systems we all use are created by the state. Um, a lot of this, a lot of this, a lot of the fundamentals that we survive on today, even to use against the state, are created by the state. True. Tor, yeah. for example. I, I did not know that. Uh, yeah, I believe, I believe, uh, I, I, I believe. DARPA you know, or something? I believe the United States government was involved in Tor because they needed a method that was safe to communicate over, and they just felt like it, if the more people using it, the harder it was, would be ah, to find them as true. well. I, I think that's kind of my real rough, shady, <laughs> shouldn't be repeating understanding. Um, uh, but, it, you know, I, I think as we've dug into this, it, it looks like what the Internet's basically going on is they're both, they're both Japanese na sounding names um, and they're both cryptocurrency enthusiasts and they both know C++. Well, you know what? It's possible, actually, now that I talk about it. It might be possible, but you just never know. And if it is, let's... Let's all pretend like it didn't happen. I don't want the mainstream media to find out. Oh, that would suck. Yeah, I hope I hope he he never gets discovered. Nobody ever knows what's going on with him yeah. or them. Yeah. All right, I want to talk about another upset. The internet 
uh, got the pitchforks out this week. <laughs> I think the uh, NSA got them all riled up. So tell me what you think of this one, Drew. Say you pre-ordered one of them Avalon batches, and you got it. You opened up. You opened up the machine, and you noticed, man, there's a little dusty. It's a little dusty in here. Man, Fingerprints on it. What this contact heck? point looks like it's been heated up an awful lot. <laughs> uh, so it turns out it looks like, not too surprising to some, Avalon is mining with customers ASICs before delivering them. Uh, this is uh, this is sort of um, started off by a talk uh, thread over on BitcoinTalk.org, and uh, here in the uh, thread he says, "Today I finally received my units from my February second order. One of them was almost clean, while the other moderately dusty." After checking all the connections and desoldering the F1 fuse, I started to configure the units. The first unit turned, it, it, he talked about the config and how it was sort of pre-configed. But then they started looking at some of the transaction addresses that Avalon has used, and it looks like Avalon has potentially mined 716 bitcoins from April 22nd with various customer units. Uh, some people estimate that Avalon ran them for as long as two weeks, maybe three weeks, in testing quote-unquote testing before they shipped a couple of things to keep in mind a lot of times when you're mass producing hardware you don't test every single unit some shops do but a lot of times you component test and if your components are verified you assemble and then you do some testing based on numbers right right so that's one thing to keep in mind the other thing to keep in mind is there is a test network you can mine on that's what butterfly labs supposedly does is they're running all of their asics on a test blockchain right so that way they're not impacting the difficulty and they're not depleting the limited supply of bitcoins because these things are super powered vacuums at this point 716 bitcoins since april 22nd with various customer units is the charge now what's a little more damning about this is people seem to have addresses you have units with wear and tear but Yifu, I'm not sure, how you, the guy that runs avalon he was at bitcoin talk it's a little hard to understand him because somebody got it with a room mic but he said we do not pre-mine. Yeah. Did you say you're mining your batch too, or you're not mining? Them? I'm not. That's the thing. Like we, we actually we had to sit down. It was it was an actual decision. Like the four of us. I mean, I'm worried I didn't to be driven, and I wasn't really sure of uh, you know like the whole the whole crew with us. I mean, it was three other people, and so we're like, okay, if we're gonna mine with batch two, you know, eventually we're deciding we're gonna make batch two or just mine with them or do something, you know. And then, and then the whole team was like, okay, let's let's actually build these units and ship them out. And and that was like a good, like you know amazing decision because it was either like make three point something million dollars in, in a month or ship and make a lot less money. A little hard to understand, but uh, he was asked by an audience member, hey, do you guys mine with other customer units? And he says, we absolutely do not. In fact, that was one of the things that was amazing quote unquote, we had a conversation about it and we said, hey, do we just build these units and make like $3 million in a month or do we make them and ship them to customers and make a lot less? And we decided to make a lot less. And that was one of the things that I was really impressed by my team is that they wanted to ship these units instead of make the money. Well, uh, I, I would have taken the first option and I, I, a couple million dollars. I think some people might want to take that option as well. I mean, maybe maybe they do it. I mean, maybe they, if they're actually doing it, they can claim that they're reducing the cost of these ASICs as they go up because they're profiting to some degree. Wouldn't that them, be so. a thing? Wouldn't that be a thing if they knocked a few hundred dollars off the price? Uh, that would be nice, but or I mean, pre, or pre-charge also- an address with some coinage. Hey, by the way, thanks for letting us test the unit. Uh, we uh. we mine fifteen bitcoins. Here's two. <laughs> you that, know, even that would help. Yeah, that that would help ease things. But I mean, uh, I, I don't know. It sounds it sounds kind of fishy. I mean, plus you can't really tell. I mean, who. You know these these addresses are their the Avalon addresses, but you can't tell. You know if they're using you know uh, customer hardware for if their own hardware. Right, you know, you right. Tell. Is it test hardware? I, oh, but again, I go back to they should be using the test blockchain. Yeah, but I mean, if you have the choice between between the two, and you're not and you're actually not mining with their hardware, and you're mining with your own that you're building or that you're you're testing or whatever, I, I would go with the regular. I mean, it's messed. It, it is kind of messed up. See, what happens kind of, though is so you buy it, say so you buy it, and then you wait for these things to ship. And meanwhile, while you're waiting, they're running the units and increasing the difficulty rating. Right. And so by the time you get it, these machines are less effective. Right. They're charging you to pay for hardware from them that they're using to make more money than you will make because they're increasing difficulty. Right. On their end. <laughs> I don't um, know, so pretty shady. Be, pretty shady. Now, maybe they'll come out and say, look, we got to test them. We might as well make some money while we're testing them. Um, but uh, it just doesn't look good, I got to tell you, at this point. And it's funny because we've all been so focused on Butterfly Labs that everybody just kind of assumed the Avalon guys were above board. Yeah, I did. 
And then we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll come out. Maybe they'll have a real good explanation. The story just kind of uh, hit today, so we haven't got a chance to really hear a response from Avalon. But, you know, you got that clip of him saying they don't do it, but then you've got these customers that are opening up their boxes. They're dusty. You've got blockchain uh, transactions that, that show 700 plus bitcoins um and i'm just not buying that they need two to three weeks to test each unit oh yeah that's that's crazy it smells it smells like a fish it maybe like maybe they're super super faily i mean if they fail a lot like if these things are dying at a, if maybe you need to maybe that's what it is because we've heard some of that too we've heard that there's been a few that haven't done so well right yeah but we'll see what happens we've got more information in the show notes and uh, uh you guys can go uh, check that out for your own but Drew, before we get out of here I got some good Litecoin news I wanted to the talk Litecoin about. Litecoin update? Oh. We teased it at the top of the show, and uh, I, I don't have a Litecoin update jingle. Um, I, I have, uh, do you think this counts? Are they serious? Does that count as a Litecoin jingle? Uh, no. no. I don't like that guy. No, okay. He's a jackass. All right, well, <laughs> That's right, Obama. <laughs> 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 All right, well, uh, Litecoin. Uh, the Litecoin development had a fundraiser. And they were trying to raise some Litecoins to uh, fund future development of the Litecoin project. And they met their goal. A big sponsor who wishes to remain anonymous is willing to support the Litecoin development team. They're offering a challenge grant where if they receive an additional 5,000 Litecoin in the community donations by June 18th noon, the anonymous sponsor will attach an additional 5,000 LTC. These combined funds will go a long way towards enabling development of Litecoin software and related vendor integration. So basically, you know, trying to rent, rent, uh, raise 10,000 uh, Litecoin, and, and they met the challenge. They... Uh, they received ten thousand or five thousand in donations, and so now they're a, a generous anonymous donor. There's always an anonymous donor at these things. Uh, is uh, going to toss another five thousand. Pretty good. So hopefully, met. it spurs something because uh, need to see, need to see some kind of infrastructure around it. Yeah, I, this was one of my reasons for shutting down my mining rig. Right, was that the project GitHub pages weren't being updated? I wasn't seeing like Electrum Litecoin get updated. I just was like, ah, this is not going anywhere. Yeah, and like a practical thing, like because um, you know one of the feedback thing they were asking whether or not we're going to take Lite- Litecoin donations, but there's a reason why you don't have a Litecoin address, right? I mean, you don't really have nothing you know, like blockchain.info or a Coinbase thing, right? You know, right, right, yeah, anything like that. What I'd love to be able to do is like integrate Litecoin in with Armory, and then I could generate, uh, you know, I could generate and track a little better the way I can do with Bitcoins now. But uh, you know, we'll see. That'll be the day when, once they once all these altcoins start integrating into you know. A couple of these, you know, local applications and blockchain and Armory and all that, Electrum and all that. That'll be that'll be nice. Yeah, that, maybe, that'll level the playing field for all of them. You I know, think. maybe if you can if you can throw a few Litecoins at some open source developers to say, hey, why don't you code in a little Litecoin support here? Here's a hundred Litecoins for your trouble. You know, that'd be worth yes. it. That'd be worth it. That'd be you know three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars depending on the on all that jazz. So maybe maybe we'll see that. So anyways, congrats to the Litecoin project. Hope you guys can keep working on and uh, you know, I know the audience out there has a lot of interest in Litecoin, so we keep you guys posted on new developments there. And don't forget we want your take on Namecoin. So we want to hear you. We want your voicemails 13525875262 or 13528plan B. And to be honest, you can call us about anything or text us. You can also text us. We also want your emails. Email the show plan B at jupiterbroadcasting.com or just go over to our website and hit that contact link at the very top of our website. Then you can just drop down and choose plan B right there from the list and uh, pretty good chance Drew will catch your email and read it. I'm in there practically every day. You're a good man, Drew. It's the yeoman's work and uh, I'm not able to get in there as much as I would like, so I'm glad you're able to do that. Well, we'd like to have you join us over at jblive.tv Tuesdays, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. GMT over at jblive.tv and jblive.info. Don't forget, we've also got the subreddit. It's not been very active lately, so if you'd like to get some content into the show, have some suggestions, some charts you want to send our way, a Bitcoin talk thread you think we need to see, submit it over on our subreddit, planbshow.reddit.com. That's the subreddit we've set up just for stuff for this show. We've also got links to our social profiles, like G+, basically, (laughs) in the show notes. Uh, Special thank you to Mr. Ronald Jenkins. You guys always ask. This music is seven times, I believe, on his new... On his, new, uh, on his new album called Days Away. We have a link to that in the show notes as well. And the thanks for the tips, too. You guys have been awesome. Helping us uh, keep some of these things funded. We really appreciate that. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for showing up for this week's episode of Plan B. See you next week. <laughs>